Okay, Iris, well, thanks for coming to do an interview. There's a lot to talk about here, but um, you've made three films so far, which is kind of really interesting, because the way your, your technique is kind of very low key, but it says a lot of big things without making big statements. Thank you. Now, is, is that a way, when you started making your first film, which was in the hotel, was, it, was that the idea of how you're going to make that film in the first place, or did that sort of style develop as you went along? It actually developed as I went along. Um, I started by working in, a, in a, recep a reception of a Jewish hotel in London, an Orthodox uh, hotel. There is a kosher hotel in London, who knew that? And I happened to be the receptionist there because I, was, I came from Israel and I was looking for a job while I studied documentary filmmaking. And I had uh, no idea that I'm going to make films at all. I just wanted to live in London. And as the receptionist, I started to have really, really interesting conversations with the guests. And as a secular Israeli, it was the first time that I had any communication with religious Jews. Because in Israel, we are very separated. We don't live in the same circles. And then as a receptionist, I was so excited to, for the first time, to have these chats. And I wanted to make a film about it. Um, and I didn't want to have the film about only the hotel and, you know, this group of religious people. I wanted to have it about our interaction. And I was looking for a way to keep the dynamic very intimate, very casual, a receptionist and a guest talking and not like an interviewer, interviewee. And I thought, I thought about the idea of bringing a camera person, but then I realized that people wouldn't open up as much as they would with just the two of us there. And I thought about uh, being behind the camera. And I also thought that would change the dynamic between us from a receptionist and a guest to an interviewer, interviewee. And I decided to put the camera on a tripod and go back to the reception, which is not that far, <laughs> <laughs> and started, you know, serving people. Of course, people that agreed. Uh, to my surprise, a lot of them agreed. And I put the camera there, went back, we started chatting and after a few minutes, both of us forgot that we were being filmed. And I was like, that's really cool. And we kept, I kept filming and I had a variety of people and I made this film, My Kosher Shift, which is my first one. And I showed it to people, festivals, and the reaction was, people were very excited about this. Many people asked me if it's a hidden camera because it felt so like it's just the two of us there no camera even. And I thought I, I should keep exploring this uh, technique. אני רווק זקן. אה, אה, כן. למה אתה כן? פעם זו הייתה בדיחה, עכשיו זה כבר מתחיל להיות נכון. אבל אתם ביחד עכשיו. ביחד עכשיו, עד מחר, עד שאני עושה. למה שלא לפחות בזקנה תנצלו את הזמן להיות ביחד? לא שאתה זקן. עכשיו צריך רק לשכנע אותה. רגע, אז בגיל כזה עדיין עושים יחסי מין? אני הייתי שמח לעשות איתה. לא, איתה אני לא, איתה אפשר לעשות. א', היא הפסיקה כבר... What happened in the hotel, and I felt that I managed to take the same uh, casual, everyday dynamic of two people talking, and I wanted to explore it with two more films uh, using the same technique, where I have the abandoned camera, the camera with no operator, unmanned camera that is just running. I speak with people that I don't really know before. I have no idea what we're going to talk about. Um, the conversation is very open. I'm opening up to people, so they ask. It's like here it's an interview and, you know, we are sitting with mics on. I'm expected to answer questions. It's like a contract between us that I, I know before coming here. Uh, what I really try to bring to my documentary films is the sense of authentic conversation. So when you do these interviews, you have to be very uh, non-judgmental. You're not bringing any agenda in 
to, to all the pieces you've done, aren't you? You're, just, you're basically talking and listening, aren't you? That's, that's your skill as an interviewer. No. You, so you are, you are <laughs> I bringing... always bring my agenda. Um, yeah, so what, what was your agenda be? The thing is that because I'm trying to create a dynamic of a normal conversation, in a normal conversation, people, you know, express their opinions. Uh, I think that if it's an interview and you have, you know, a set of questions that you're going to ask someone, then it's different. You're planning things. I don't know the people that I'm speaking with while filming. I mean, it's random people that happen to be in the space where I am. Uh, in the first two films I worked in the, in the space, I was a receptionist, and then in Women in Sync, I took the job of a shampoo girl in a hair salon. So I was talking to women while I was washing their hair. זה גרוע לשמוע את זה ככה, אבל זה האמת. זה הדדי, תאמיני לי, וזה ככה. ואנחנו גדלנו שהיהודים רוצים להרוג אותנו. זה ככה, מה? השנאה, כן. ועובדה, הנה, את נמצאת אצלי, ו-80% מהאוכלוסייה שלי, הקליינטים, הם יהודים. אנשים הם אנשים מסתדרים. כשאין מנהיגים, ואין פוליטיקה, ואין זה, אנשים מסתדרים. ממש ככה. במיוחד נשים. אני להגיד. רוצה להגיד לך שאם נשים היו מנהלות את העניינים, גם את הפוליטיקה, מזמן, מזמן, מזמן היינו כאן חיים בשלום עם כל האזור הזה. Again, customers, random customers, no idea who is the woman that I'm washing her hair and what we're going to talk about. I did, however, have a direction from, I mean, I'm a Jew, I'm coming to a, a Christian Arab hair salon. I'm interested in how Arab women who live in Israel feel about, you know, the, 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 the city that we both grew up in. So from the nature of, of you know, uh, the interaction between two people that come from different backgrounds or my idea for the film, there were, you know, some uh, themes that came up. Uh, and what you asked before, like, I'm a, I'm a very, um, I don't want to say opinionated person because it's like opinionated woman. It's like ridiculous. But I think since I was a child, I, I don't like formality and I don't like seriousness. And I always express what's on my heart and mind. And I don't have it's not that I don't have tact. I just think people should express how, like, what they feel. And I think that's what I'm trying to get from people because when you are a bit formal and when you, are, when you think too much about what you're going to say, then I think psychologically I'm interested in the things that people just say when they don't think too much. Yeah, I think that's what, kind of what I meant. I mean, you don't come there, you know, like when you see documentaries, as soon as you documentary about this, from somebody's point of view, and you're either for or against that point of view, and that's how a documentary plays out. But the ones that you do, you, can't, you let the people speak, and whether they say things you don't agree with, you don't get in there and say, I don't agree with that. You just let them say their piece. And that's what I liked about the stuff that you do. It's just like, it, it does present an argument, but it just lets the people speak. And I think that's what's interesting because there's not enough, I don't think there's in, in modern media, there's enough uh, people speaking in their different shades of opinion and there's not enough listening. And I think what you're very good at is both, you let the people speak and you actually listen to what they say. And I, I think that, that's what I meant when you don't actually bring your agenda in, it's not stamped all over the film. So in a sense, when you say you do have an agenda, is the agenda having no agenda? <laughs> I mean, is it, <clears throat> or do you think that's kind of a truism? I think that um, now I, I made a new film, Unsettling, and it's, it's about settlers, West Bank settlers, and people really struggle with the idea that I let them express their opinions without uh, arguing, debating. And for me, so I do have my agenda as the starting point. I never hide my agenda. I come and I say, look, I lef I'm left-wing, I'm against the occupation, I'm against the settlements, but let, let's talk. 
And then when people express their opinions, I respect their opinions and I let them express them. It doesn't mean that I agree with them, but some people find it very hard to, um, like a lot of people tell me, why didn't you, you know, tell this guy like, hey, but you know what? I think that again, for me, psychologically, when there is an argument, so people are closing down, it's not, I want to open people up. Uh, I'm interested in hearing their opinions. I'm, I know what my opinions are, but I'm not afraid, first of all, to listen to other opinions and explore mine and rethink mine. And I want, I think it's better to let people express themselves and have it in your documentary and then other people listen to it and get to know people. למה לך כל כך חשוב לבוא לפה ולהגיד לכולם, אני שמאלנית? כי שואלים אותי על מה הסרט, בעיניי זה סרט השמאלנית שעוברת לגור בהתנחלות. אין לי אמפתיה לצד השני. למה? זה לא יכול להיות שהערבים חיים כאן כאילו שזה אדמה שלהם, ואנחנו כאילו חיים בפחד. אם זה שלנו, אז זה שלנו. הפסקתי ללמוד, כי גיליתי את הגבעות, ויש חבורה של ילדים שגרים לבד על הר. עוברים חיילים, אומרים לך, בוא'נה, את משוגעת. ואני יושבת כל הלילה עם הסכין. הוא רץ אליי ודקר אותי פעם אחת, ובאמת לא היה נראה מחבל. שתי משלחות באו לסולחה, וקיימו תפילה, זה היה מרגש מאוד. <laughs> אצלי על השטיח, על הוואקבר. <laughs> זה לא משנה כמה שמאלני תהי. כאילו, מה את חושבת, שהערבים לא ישנאו אותך בגלל שאת שמאלנית? That was what was fascinating about unsettling. It was, it's obviously like, uh, of course it's wrong being there, but everybody who was there was for completely different reasons. From the woman who was completely unapologetic about, I am a fascist, to, to just really normal people who didn't really seem to have any idea what they were doing probably wasn't that right. They were just normal people bringing their kids up. in a, what looks ostensibly like a nice area. And all those different shades of opinion and all those different lives in there and all the reasons for people being there, you reflect it so beautifully in that film in, in a very fantastically mundane setting as well. It wasn't like tanks everywhere. It's just, it's just a really boring looking street. <laughs> and it's, it's not what you get on the news and it presents a very different version of the big story. Like the, 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 the micro stories are what makes it fascinating. Is that a deliberate kind of ploy as well? Yeah, I, I think... Uh, for me, my films are uh, personal journeys. So, again, like now I showed the film and people told me, hey, but you didn't show this and that. I was like, when I went to the settlement, to, I, I rented a, a flat in the settlement and I decided to live there for two months. Uh, I wanted to see how it's like to be a settler and try to uh, embed myself into the community. And... The, what was for me very strong uh, and a strong dissonance was uh, the hippie vibe of the settlement. And I thought that that's much more interesting than showing, you know, <laughs> army. I did show the army, but like the villas and the hippie vibe and the occupation was for me a contradiction. Um, so I don't show things that maybe the media would show, but I show my perspective. And my films are always about, they are very personal, even if it's political and it's, uh, you know, different people express their opinions, there's always like my journey and through people. I think that uh, we have a lot of ideas about uh, communities, uh, stereotypes, we don't, we have lack of knowledge Uh, about many different you know places and communities and we read about them and we have our opinions already set but then I always see that when I go to a place and I meet people the experience is different because people are different and it's easier to look at them from outside as a group and I think that uh, there are two kinds like documentary wise some documentaries keep this uh, outside look uh, trying to find the things that people have in common 
for instance, like, uh, you know, the, the old National Geographic, historical BBC uh, documentaries that said, so Orthodox Jews in London go to synagogues, they do this, they do that. So they look at them as a group. Whereas I try to look at individuals and through my films bring you a, a collection of different people that wouldn't really let you frame them because of the differences they have and because of the things that you'd find that you have in common with them. And that's what happened to me uh, at the hotel when I met like the rabbis and like really, <laughs> uh, you know, interesting looking people. And I thought like, you know, I came like, home last night from like gay bar at 4 a.m. And here I am at the reception of an ultra Orthodox Jewish hotel, mm. speaking with people for hours. And we are so different, you know, for them it was the first time that they speak with a single woman, you know, a secular Israeli. They were curious. I was curious to, to get to know their mysterious world. They're as curious and my world is as mysterious to them. I mean, do you find any commonality with, with people? Yes, yeah, a lot. So a what lot. kind of commonalities do you find with completely different types of Jewish people? I mean, also probably beyond Jewish people as well, but let's talk about this in context of Israel, because yeah, it's yeah. interesting, but when you meet these people, very, very different from you, very different version of being Jewish. What's the bits that you connect on? The personal ones and psychological ones, like if we, you know, we have a click or we are, like when I met you, I liked you right away because you like, so things like that, it's not about where they're from and if they have a beard or uh, if there are settlers. So yes, there are, you know, the huge gap between us politically, uh, if, if it's about religion, but sometimes you just find, you know, common interests with people and you just uh, get along really, really well. And I think that in my films, um, the characters that made it into the film and, and I didn't cut out uh, are the ones that probably we had this chemistry or um, because then the, the conversation is more interesting. Is that, that's interesting because so if you didn't get on with somebody, you, they just wouldn't get in the film. That's actually more interesting if I don't get on with yeah, someone. Yeah, I'm just kind of, <laughs> yeah, I'm just kind of wondering. I wish I had more of that. Because I'm interested in the editing process. What what you take out is probably not because the films are great, but I'm, I'm kind of interested what you take out because it kind of dictates what the film becomes. So what is the decision process of what doesn't get into the film? First of all, I, I don't cut between people. So a lot of like documentaries are like news, you know, items that take a, um, a theme and then it cuts between people, uh, you know, from one statement to another. I do like uh, a whole conversation with a person, even though it's, when I filmed it, it was two hours and then it's going to be just five minutes in the film. But I want to bring you the sense of conversation uh, that is happening organically. Um, so I choose uh, the strongest characters and that together create something strong. So uh, in Women in Sync, for instance, I had a lot of women. I shot a lot of women in the sink and I had to choose. So I had some women that said really strong statements that I wanted in the film, but then as a whole character, it wasn't strong enough. Uh, or it didn't work for me, like in terms of the journey that I wanted to, to create. So I chose the strongest characters and I put them in order that would show kind of like what I want to show and the, the journey. So, again. so you have an idea what the journey is before you make the film? No. So no, the, no, the no. film actually takes the journey as you go along, it sort of tells its own story. The script is, is, I write the script in the editing room, you can say, not mm. physically, but... Wow, uh, it's quite complex. I mean, that sort of thing, it sounds like it's easy, just chopping all the good bits out, but that sounds a lot harder to do. I think documentary, my, my kind of documentary, I mean, some documentaries are being prepared very well. People do research about uh, uh, characters that would fit the concept. Like for instance, in Women in Sync, if I wanted, I wanted uh, Arab women from Haifa that would be more political, maybe anti-Israel, uh, pro-Palestine, 
And if I made the film that I wanted, I would go find, you know, people that suit, you know, this idea. And then normally people would do a, a research. They would know before filming what the character is about to say, more or less, a pre-interview interview. Uh, and then you are prepared. In my case, I just throw myself on like the situation and then I don't know who I'm going to meet and what's going to happen. So in Women in Sync, I wanted a very different film and I ended up with a film about coexistence. I didn't want any Jews in my film at the beginning. I didn't want, you know, um, when I, I went to the editing room, I, I watched the materials and I was like, oh my God, there's no film here. It's so like, the opinions are so gray or nuanced. Yeah, but that's the beauty, I think. And I, there was a, I read an interview you've done where you talk about it's actually the shades of gray, and that's the fascinating bit, that in, in the 21st century, probably because of social networking, everybody's trying to shout louder than everyone else, and everybody becomes far more extreme than they actually are. And actually, most people are quite dull, but the dullness is actually quite beautiful, isn't it? And, the Shades of Grey is what's fascinating, and all the great films are where you can hear the clocks ticking, and I like that in your films, you know, the there's, there's space, and it's actually just the mundanity of normal life and really weird situations, and that's what fascinates about it, and people, when they're talking, you know, obviously, in, in Unsettling, the woman saying, she's, oh, I'm a fascist, and that, that's, you know, that's a very big headline, but it's the other stuff I was interested in, the people just taking their kids to school, or... The mundanity is actually what becomes utterly fascinating. And is that, is that a deliberate process as well, or is it just, are you trying to tell that kind of story, the, the, the normality in the, in the strangeness? That, that, for instance, is a concept that came about after living there and in the editing room from my, my experience of living in the settlement. Uh, it felt like a part of Israel. It felt like I'm speaking with people like my friends in Tel Aviv. You know, how I imagined settlers before being there and what happened when I lived there, it was entirely different. Now, that's an interesting point. So if you can expand on that, I mean, even... I mean, for, in the UK, obviously, we're going to have a very warped idea of this. Our idea of settlers are just kind of like crazy people, machine Cuckoos, guns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like anybody who's not ultra-Orthodox Jewish is going to get a kicking walking down the street. But and, and what was So when you're in Tel Aviv, what's your idea of settlers? And, and let's remember, it's only, what's it, 30 miles, you told me? It's not that far, it's, it's an hour. Yeah, it's an hour drive. But it's, it's, it's a totally different world in your head. And when you go there, it was actually the same. So is that, is that how it works? It is the same, but it's very different. I mean, it's very isolated and, you know, it's a different, different mentality in terms of, like, uh, security and, and you see the occupation in your own eyes you know, Palestinian cars and Jewish cars, different treatment, checkpoints, signs. I'm not allowed to go to a Palestinian village. They, of course, aren't allowed to come to Jewish uh, towns. But I think that when I met the people that were sitting with me and talking, so except for some crazy Americans that just moved to the settlements, they have guns and are... Just like, <laughs> like what you described. Uh, <laughs> When I met people, if you, if you look at my unsettling, most, I mean, old people there are young and most of them are second generation settlers. And that's something that I, again, uh, realized while being there and, and even stronger in the editing room, I realized that the people that I found mon most interesting to speak with are second generation settlers. Well, why is Meaning that? people that didn't choose to, to move there. It's not an ideological uh, act living there for them it's their home and it complicates the discussion a bit because they they were born there and because I think because now you have Facebook and and everything that's why the slang was the same like we watch the same TV shows we are in the same groups on Facebook so communities are now expanding and you know as the Israeli society they are part of the Israeli society and we had a lot in common in that sense. Yeah, 
הרגשה שלי שאתה תמיד מנסה להסביר לי איך הדברים כן בסדר. לא, הרבה דברים לא נראים. אני מהיום הראשון אמרתי לך, יש פה דברים שלא נוח לי איתם, לי לא נוח איתם, הם לא נראים טוב. צריך להיות עם, 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 עם אינטליגנציה מינימלית כדי להסתכל על הסיטואציות ולהגיד, בואנה, זה פשוט לא נראה טוב, זה לא מה, טוב, מה זה מה לא צריך לך? להיות. אתה אף לא מביע לי משהו מפריע לך. הרבה דברים מפריעים לי. כמו? המון. נאם וואן. הדבר הראשון שמפריע לי זה שאם אני לא מגיע תוך שלוש דקות לעשות פנייה, לא, אנחנו נדבר, לא, יש הרבה דברים. אז על זה אני רוצה לדבר איתך. בסדר. על מה כן מפריע לך? כי אתה כל הזמן, שוב, פרסומת לחיים הטובים. We had a lot of arguments, political arguments, but I did feel that they're kind of like, it could have been my friends if they were born in Tel Aviv. You know? Yeah, 40 minutes away. Yeah. I mean, how much of the film's about you? You know, it's, it's, it is a personal journey. Is it, is it trying to explain your relationship with Israel as well? I think that if you take my, my three films so far, they are all about my identity as well. So when I moved to London, I was, as an Israeli, I found a job in an in a, a ultra-Orthodox Jewish hotel. I'm very secular. And for me, it was like, what am I more? Am I... more Jewish, am I more Israeli? Because, in, you know, for Jews, you have that as well. You can say you're like an atheist Jew. <laughs> People are like, what? But I started, when I moved away from home, I started like uh, thinking about my identity because I was in, like, in London all of a sudden. It's not my home. You know, I'm a foreigner. And then at the hotel, where it's like, it's so different than me, again, rabbis and everything, I felt that it's like a pocket in London that is kind of like home to me. And the film about, because I am very personal in my films, I talk about myself and I, I you know, expose myself as well. Uh, so the films are about me and about my political views and about my uh, different perspectives. And also in the settlement, this, in, Like Women in Sync, the second, it's also about my hometown, Haifa, where I grew up. I was never, I had never had any communication with uh, the Arab community there. We don't mix at all. We go to different schools. Uh, so it was the first time that I, I you know, visited. I, I, you know, I passed through there, but actually spent time in a, like, in a, neighborhood that is 10 minutes drive from where I live. And also I have, um, my father came from Egypt and, and his father was Muslim. So I'm, I, I, I think it's, all the three films are, uh, are an identity journey for me. And unsettling, it's, it's also about like, my views about Israel and the occupation, but also like in unsettling, I think I, I went even further in, in terms of uh, bringing the personal journey, the narrative, like into the film. It is about the journey, about trying to make the film, about moving to a settlement, about hating it there, not fitting, uh, trying to get people to talk to me. Uh, it's kind of like, I felt like in high school when I tried to, you know, the cool kids don't want to be my friends and, Things that are very psychological, emotional. I was very vulnerable there. Um, but I think that's, that's what's interesting to me when making films. I'm not, I don't come as a professional. I'm, I'm unguarded in that sense. I'm going through a personal, uh, emotional experience. And yeah, and that's what I really love about the films because they're not, they're not documentaries, are they? They're not, like I was saying before, not traditional documentaries where you're trying to find a truth There is no truth, is there? Everything's blurred, everything's a million different truths all at the same time. But on, on, it really is about you and the whole, the whole things. And that's what makes it, as a viewer, makes it more interesting because you kind of go on this journey with somebody trying to understand what is this thing called Israel? What's this thing called me? And because you come from a town that's a very liberal town as well. Um, and it's a, it's a different type of Israel than we're presented in the West. All these things are very fascinating to watch as a viewer and things. So, so this, this kind of background, this confusion, and everything's in there, and this idea of all the shades of grey, that's, that's kind of you and it trying to explain 
trying to find yourself. And so when you get to the end of the process, and you're not the end yet, because I guess it's an ongoing process of making these films. Like life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, what have you found out about yourself in the three films so far? From what you said now, I thought about, like, uh, I think confusion is a very strong word that I, 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 is very, it's present in my films. And also, like, I like to be confused and, and see what's, where I'm going and, like, I'm, I'm trying to break things. I'm not trying to build things and bring um, conclusions. I want to actually break your perception of settlers, not break, but in a, like a strong statement, but try to unfold or, or play with things. Um, that's what happened in, in these three films because it didn't happen like I planned it or wanted it to be. And then that was interesting to me and that's the reaction or, or the process that I want to, to bring about. Yeah, because it's interesting that trying to... Well, I didn't talk, answer your question at no, all. No, it's, it's interesting because that's a few interesting points. I mean, this idea, the rigidity of society, you know, the rigidity of people's notions of things, trying to unravel those and break them down is a very powerful statement, isn't it? So, and that's what you're trying to do here, isn't it? Like, people say, I believe in this and I will not budge from this. I will not change my idea. But what you're doing is kind of saying, but this, that, that is, there is no rock-solid truth, is there? Yeah, I, I think I want to have it both with my uh, subjects, I want it to happen to both of us, that we kind of like, uh, you know, aren't sure about, because of the exchange of thoughts, this like process makes us uncertain, confused and more open. And that's what I also wish to have when it gets to my viewers that they will have the same experience of uncertainty and, and questioning things. And I think that's more interesting than like bringing my opinions, you know, explanation, explanation mark, that's the situation. These are the bad people. These are the, you know, victims. Everything is sorted, now take mm. it. <laughs> yeah. I want to kind of like, you know, have this like dance of not you know, being sure about what's, what's going on. Now when I show my new film, I have people saying like, you know, fuck you, I, I fell in love with your settlers in the film, but I also hated them and like, what's going on? Good. Mm. And I have people being very upset about, you know, the film, both from left and right. So I think it's, it's a good thing that people can, I don't need the, People will like me all the time. It's okay. Um, I can handle it if it makes them, you know, think a bit after they watch my film. That's amazing. I'm, I'm grateful for that because I think that if you make films that will just echo your opinions and people that agree with you in the first place will say, yeah, that's what's going on in the world. It's, it's not... You know. No, we always used to say in punk, you had to question everything. So even the stuff you believe in, you have to question it as yeah. well, which is kind of what you're, you're testing your own beliefs at the same time as testing the other people's beliefs that you don't believe in. And I, th I think that's a really important thing. So what, what, in Israel itself, what, what do people think of you now? Because the films don't, they're starting to break through quite big in Israel. Is it, is it a point of quite big debate? Uh, it just started in Israel now. We, we started screening the film, uh, except for like a film festival, festival that was back in May. Uh, I had different screenings, different crowd. I had like religious people, settlers coming uh, two days ago to Jerusalem to watch the film. Um, again, it's like people don't know how to judge it. So I got really, really good um, responses from people, reactions. Um, but people are used to either agree with something or disagree. And if you put the in like the gray scale, uh, I think it's it's there's some anxiety for people when they're not sure what they they're supposed to feel. I I had that when I made the film. Um, but I think that it's everyone 
that spoke with me after watching said, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm going to think about it. I'm still thinking about it. And that's for me the biggest compliment because, you know, it's, it's not a feel-good a feel film and it's not about, you know, again, just letting people know that what they think is, is, is right. So I had some reactions from people. A lot of people asked me, do you think the group of people you brought represent settlers? They're so nice, they're so open-minded. And I'm like, representation is not statistics. <laughs> you know, it's in anthropology, there is representation where you choose to represent a society. It could be through one person. It's not like if we're going to knock on all the doors of the settlers and we're going to come up with like, you know, wow, different kind of... Some films do that. They show you there was, there was another film a few years ago that kind of like mapped you know, the different kind of settlers, and these are the opportunistic ones, and these are the, you know, the religious ones. And I, I don't think also like that people, um, when they see something that doesn't represent, but they agree with, for instance, showing like crazy settlers from Hebron uh, as a representation, you know, people don't say, hey, excuse me, most settlers aren't like that. But when I showed like, normal, nice people. And I'm not trying to humanize settlers, it's not my, it's, it's too It's just cliche. what's there in front of you, isn't it, when you go there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the people that I met. That's the, I found these people interesting. I think it's interesting and important to listen to the people that I brought. They bring some complexity. I still disagree with them politically. I want to think that if I were born there, I would leave. I wouldn't be able to stay there. Uh, I don't know though, because you know, I I I, I was born in Haifa. Uh, but I think this complexity is, is is important to bring to me at least. I mean, uh, and then if people, you know, rethink their thoughts, it's and this this kind of idea is that there's nuances. It's complex. It's just a very difficult thing to present in a society like Israel, which I imagine. It's quite. A, it's a very. It has to be a rigid society because it defines itself on what it thinks it is. It's, I mean, obviously, it's a very different kind of state than any other kind of state, isn't it? It's a religious-based state, obviously, superimposed, you know, on an area which, when it wasn't there, etc., etc. It's got a complex history. A lot of, a lot of. Issues. So it has to be rigid <laughs> to define exactly what it is. And you're you're actually turning up saying it's not that rigid at all. That must be quite a, quite a shock to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, a subtle shock, but a big shock. In Israel, everyone is, is uh, it's very polarized uh, by politics and, and religion, but everyone has a very strong opinion and they express it all the time, everywhere. Uh, you cannot avoid that. Even if you just, you're drunk, 3 a.m., you take a taxi, the taxi driver will start a conversation about the prime minister and, you know, you're going to, argue with them about occupation <laughs> in the middle of the night. People are obsessed with it. That's the only prism through which we see the world because it's a very, it's in the everyday life in Israel. Uh, since you were born, like the Arabs around us are the enemy. They don't want us there. There, they, they used to be wars like every 10 years, uh, you know, everyone's father went like, you know, as a soldier through a war, and you know, I was in the army, um, and it's very political. But I think that Israelis are, because it's a young country, 70 year old uh, people, it's not that rigid. Like, people are flexible and they are open to this, like, you know, people are used to, to, to other people expressing their opinions. They will fight with you, like, but, but it's okay. So I'm actually more scared about showing my film here in London than in Israel, because in Israel, if someone shouts at me, I can say like, hey, relax. Uh, and it's okay, because I'm, I'm an Israeli in Israel. Um, in Israel, I was more worried about my left-wing friends. 
In that didn't like the idea of me oh, going okay, to a settlement in the first yeah. place, yeah. showing settlers, don't make them look good. That's what I heard a lot. And then the settlers like, don't make us look bad. And I was just in between. But my screening here uh, in London and, and showing the film here, I think it's, it's much harder for me than in Israel. Mm. Because um, there's a very odd idea what Israel is over here as well. And is that another idea? that you don't feel comfortable with, you know, this idea, if, you know, if people make art or play in bands, they're not allowed to play in Israel because it's this, this and this. And is that another rigidity that you kind of find confusing or do you agree with it or do you, or is it anything, or is it just something you can't even have a set opinion on because it fluctuates so much? Because I studied here and I lived here and I, I you know, my milieu was very like here left. I, I was a bit tired of saying like, apologizing for being from Israel. So Israel is where I was born. <laughs> I didn't choose that. Um, would be probably better to not to have this like uh, loaded, you know, political, the political weight. And, but that's, that's where I'm from. Someone asked me about um, showing my film here. She was like, look, I want to buy a ticket to your film but I wondered if you got some money from an Israeli uh, fund. And I was like, look, I, I live in Israel now, I pay taxes, so if you boycott, boycott me, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a product, I'm an Israeli product. Yeah. I don't like this binary of like, okay, this is, shouldn't be heard. I mean, I think there should be really strong sanctions on Israel, financial ones, uh, political acts to stop the occupation from this country, from other European countries, from the states, even though now it's not really the, the, the direction. But when, when it comes to individuals, and I, I, I can respect people that say, I don't want to play in Israel. Bands, by all means, your choice. But when I make a film, first of all, I'm happy that I, I got I didn't get that much money. My films are very guerrilla, tiny in the productions. Uh, but if I still get money from, you know, uh, an Israeli broadcaster, that without it I wouldn't be able to do my to make my film. Even though I say it's a fascist country and it's an apartheid, then first of all it it, it shows that it's still <laughs> we're allowed to do that. And also, like, I think that boycotting uh, Israeli artists that make films. Most of the Israeli artists that make films or any sort of art are ones that try to criticize what's going on in Israel. So blocking them is not a very lefty act, as I see it. So again, it's a, it's a much more complex situation. It's not a black and a white, is it? Like people present the arguments here. The gray. That, the gray yeah, all color. Israel bad, and that's it, isn't it? And, and that's the whole argument. But you're presenting all these other different versions, which is difficult for these people to listen to as well. And is that part of the reason why showing the film in London is even more complex than showing it in Israel? Yeah, by all means. I think that people here, they know a lot about what's going on in Israel. They're very opinion opinionated about it. They are against the occupation, which I totally a part of and agree with. Um, but I think that it's important to have discussions. It's important to uh, to see what's going on in a place where we have a lot of opinions on. And also, like, I find it really funny because the boycott thing, because my Palestinian friends, they also take money from Israeli funds to make films. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's the only way, uh, if you're an Israeli, mm -hmm. uh, to make films. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really... I think that when I started, when I edited the film, I was really nervous about every line that a person, a subject says, and if I can put it in, it, and, and the meaning, the political meanings of, you know, putting things together, and the, the whole, the overall statement, it, I felt like I'm in court. I'm going to be judged for everything that... And were you? Yeah, but I, I was worried, but now I'm, I'm kind of like, Bring it on, I'm tough now, I can handle it. I wrote my PhD about my films, about all the three of them, and about unsettling, and I 
kind of like visited every angle that I can, reflecting on, on the process. So I think that now I'm, I can handle, you know, tough questions. I think the problem is that you're going to have is now that you're, you're kind of getting known for making these films. How do you make the next one? Because the people's relationship to you will change, won't it? They'll go, oh, I know what she's up to. I know, I know how this kind of works. So will people change their way they relate to you getting filmed? You know, I'm not you... a celebrity like you, you know. <laughs> people don't <laughs> recognise me. If you get too yet. known, though, and, and these films will get more and more known in Israel, especially. Small country, and it's it's not you know it's people. It's going to this size of the country where everyone kind of knows everyone else. How do, how would you operate when you got to, if you got to that level? I think that my uh, my forte, like my thing, I'm, before I'm a, I'm a filmmaker. My and and my my uh, my passion and my joy is speaking with people and make them open up and. I really love that. That's my motivation before anything else. It's just that like cinema and, and films, it was the medium for me to, to show this interaction with people. But the interaction is what I'm really crazy about. And I, I, I'm sure that I can continue to do that, like doing that. But also my next films, I have one that I want to film in the States and another one in Egypt. I'm trying to now uh, develop them, but it's not going to be in Israel. Hopefully. Oh yeah, okay, so it's going to be more of an international. So it's the same style, we're going to different places. One, same style, still like um, trying to get into a community, uh, but in the States. And the other one is about my personal, uh, like my family and my Arab mm, uh, background in Egypt. Because again, that shows, again, the complexity of what Israel is, isn't it? And the complexity of Jewishness as well, isn't it? Because it's not, it's not, it's not a race of people, is it? Like people always say, it's, it's like every, any kind of humans anywhere. It's a mixture of people in one, in one place, isn't it? And the idea it's all different backgrounds, different people, all mixed together. That, that must be quite a powerful statement to make in Israel itself as well, mustn't it? Now the discourse in Israel is very much about uh, like how Israel tried to create the Sabra, like the, the Israeli uh, that would speak in a certain accent and like would try to um, eliminate some uh, elements from especially from it was more of a European uh, Israeli than uh, you know Arab Jew Israeli so a lot of people in Israel came from Arab countries but um, the state was very European oriented at least and Israel tried to look at itself as, you know, uh, a Western, <laughs> a European country. Your vision um, song contest country. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have that as well. But for instance, my, my grandmother who came from Egypt, her music, she was a big promise in Egypt. She used to sing to the king and she starred in like films, in Egyptian films. But then she came to Israel. Her music wasn't something that is considered culture so she was a cleaner and then uh, only at night there was this uh, little club that played arab you know music it had arab uh, singers but now in israel it's all about like people are now talking about how they try to suppress you know um, israeli jews uh, uh, arab country jews and now that's kind of like, actually it's stronger than talking about the occupation now. It's very much about that. The actions, what is Jewishness? No, it's more about like what you, like as a country did, as a state to the Arab, uh, the Jews that came from Arab countries and how you try to suppress it and how you try to get them. Because um, people were ashamed of their Arabness because of the situation that Israel uh, is in the middle of Arab countries, so Arabs are the enemy, so people that came from Arab countries and are Jews, are Israelis, are, didn't want to be associated with these countries. So the, the accent, like for instance, my, my grandmother, she sp spoke Arabic was her first language, but they, they were ashamed of their Arabness in this, you know, um, and you're quite proud of your Arab 
So quarter. now I'm proud, but yeah. it used to be like something that people weren't proud of. And do you think this is a, a, a thing for the future for Israel to sort of embrace actually what it is in the world? And maybe it's more, a lot more Arabic than it, really, than it thinks it is. Yeah, it's now starting to have this um, understanding. The thing is that um, it's very complicated, but most like people that came from Arab countries are usually the very right <laughs> right wing ones that are against you know Arab countries. Like my grandmother, she was like, "Don't trust Arabs. I live there." <laughs> So it's, it's all mixed and it's, it's crazy in Israel. There are so many, when it comes to identities, because it's a young country, because people came from many different backgrounds and now they're together and like, oh, we're Jewish, so we're like together. And there, there is a lot of tension. I think that Israel is in the process of, of um, it's, like, it's like a teenager. It's still starting to, it's still trying to, to understand what it is and like when you're like when you are a teenager like oh this is growing and oh that's that's happening to me <laughs> um, and then at the background like part of the, the, the Israeli identity as as a state you have you know the, the politics um, you have the uh, the fact that we are surrounded by countries that we cannot visit. Like, I remember, I remember when I lived here, we just took a car and drove to another country, and I was like, that never happens in Israel. So you have Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt. You can go to Jordan and Egypt, but it's, you should be cautious as an Israeli. And so, like, when I walked, when I moved to London also, when I walked in the street, I was like, if someone is running, I'm like, oh, I'm hysterical. My father speaks Arabic. I used to, to hear him speaking with my grandmother, but when I hear Arabic in the street, sometimes I'm, that's my... <laughs> mm. Sort of schizophrenic <laughs> mindset. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think that we're really fucked up as a country because we have a lot of layers of identity that are not in good, good terms with each other sometimes. Um, but that's... Again, why I think that people are open there, even though they could be crazy, very outspoken, uh, everyone, not just me. Uh, but it's okay to argue. It's okay to bring up things that sometimes in other cultures it, it's considered rude to, to talk about. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I want to... I think keep exploring my identity, but this time more straightforward uh, in a personal journey that is personal per se. Uh, because I have a family in Egypt, a Muslim family that I never, I've never met. Uh, we've never been in touch. I don't know who they are, what their names are, um, and I'm really, I'm really curious about it. And I want to also bring my grandmother's story. Uh, she had a very uh, symbolic life and uh, she, she fell in love with my grandfather who was a musician, uh, a canoe player, and they fell in love and they got married and they had my father and then he divorced her, he moved to the States and she had to, um, to escape to Israel through Italy. She put all her money on my father's education and I'm kind of like telling you the story now. I hope that's okay. <laughs> it's a pretty good story. You can cut yeah. it later. <laughs> uh, and then when my father grew up, his father, Muhammad, uh, from Brooklyn, he lived in Brooklyn, told him, like, we have to meet. They met. And then after a while, he said, I want to remarry your mother. So they married for the second time after 35 years. And after a few years in, in New York, they came to Israel and they lived together. So I want to tell their story, her story, her life story, which is political. It's about, you know, love against, you know, you know, the, the, the different religion, ethnicity, uh, you know, Muslim and a Jew. And also like my search for my family and if I will be able to unite with my family, uh, 
find any commonality with these people you never met in a completely different culture. Even me meet them, because mm. people in Egypt are uh, afraid to meet like Israeli people. Um, it's, it's very tense for an Israeli to... I, I cannot just go there and, and film. There's so many angles on this. You know, it, it is a story of Israel and Egypt. It's a story, it's a love story. It's a personal journey. It's a fantastic uh, idea for a project. And are you going to, is this filmed in the same kind of style or is this going to bring in different kind of filmmaking techniques? Different techniques. Uh, I think that because this time I'm, I'm always a character in my films, sometimes a very, uh, you know, just my hands or my back at the reception. My hands in women in sync, in unsettling it was even more, but then now I want to be able to have someone observing also what's going on. Um, but I think in terms of like my, my conversations with my father, uh, I tried to film something and I had a camera person, a sound man, uh, a producer, and I realized how my father and I, we speak like differently. So I think that I really like the, the abandoned camera so you'll be bringing for, for conversations. Abandoned, as much as you can, you'll bring the abandoned camera in yeah. to make this, this film. Because I realized it also affects me when people are, when there's an operator behind the camera, I, I act differently. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think that my father is getting older and I really want him to meet his, you know, Egyptian family, Arab family. Very emotional film to make, I'd imagine. Hopefully, emotions yeah. are good for the cinema. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, well, good for life as well. <laughs> yeah, good for life. Have you, and is this just an idea at the moment? Have you actually started the process? Or trying to find these people, how do you find all these? Uh, the thing is that this kind of film, I want to every uh, effort to find them to be filmed. So it's kind of like I need to work on developing it, but I need money to develop it, and I'm, I'm starting to write a proposal and, and work on it. Okay, well, good luck with that. Looking forward Thank to you. seeing that. Thank you, Iris. Yeah. Oh, that's it? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you.